we all set here? Is it? We have a machine in there. It's coming. It's it's set up. It's okay. I won't touch anything here. Yeah. Okay. We can wake it up. Okay. We'll be waking the, the we'll be waking the the laptop up momentarily to begin. <coughs> Thanks everybody for coming in this evening and joining us to welcome back to welcome back to the AA this evening, Sylvia Levin, who joins us from Los Angeles. I think just came in from the West Coast today um, for a quick trip to Europe. Um, Sylvia's lecture this evening titled, uh, I have it here somewhere, Some, Something Old, Something New, um, will carry forward tomorrow morning, just as a reminder at the outset, in an open theory seminar that I very much invite all of you to come in and attend. Uh, it'll be up in the front members room beginning at 11 a.m which will carry forward the discussion that starts tonight with Sylvia's lecture, uh, which will be hosted by Mark Campbell in the Histories and Theories program here at the AA. Tonight's talk um, is part of Sylvia's current work as a theorist, a historian, a critic, and an educator, focusing very much on the topic of the contemporary in architecture and the relationship between those two words, which we hear often used in various forms. Um, and I think one of her really great contributions as a theorist and historian today is absolutely that of trying to connect in careful, calculated, analytic ways the relationship or the relationships we all might be constructing for that relationship between theory and whatever it is we call practice in contemporary architecture. The fact that she has been turning her attention towards the topic of the contemporary in architecture in many recent essays, lectures, and in uh, and, and articles, um, I think demonstrates um, very much the way in which her thinking as a theorist, theorist um, stands out in a world today in which um, theory is wandering in ways that architects are quite accustomed to, but the field itself is now trying to think through uh, in terms of its consequences. Um, uh, her, her interest is very much on the way in which architects use and misuse the word contemporary in, in their contemporary uh, discussions and projects these days as, as she writes, and I think it's quoted on the poster I just saw outside uh, uh, in the hallway, just because you've read a new book on architecture recently doesn't mean it was contemporary, <coughs> although many books have used the term or claim its qualities. While there are plenty of new books on architecture, the discipline has no theory of contemporaneity uh, and without which there can be no contemporary architecture. Uh, as I say, and particularly in a school like this, the topic of the new and the contemporary is an incredibly um, important one. It's one you hear so often here in the building that it's treated almost as inevitable as gravity and the other features that we all organize as architects. Um, uh, and her interest, I think, at a certain level is to, to look at the topic of what constitutes history and the historical today um, in a funny way through the back door of the contemporary, the new, and the present day world that we live in. Um, Sylvia's books and articles have extensively analyzed post-war American and other architectural cultures. You all will know these books and articles. In 2004, her book Form Follows Libido examines um, the psychoanalytic culture of architectural modernism through the work of R Richard Neutra. Uh, specifically, and I think probably more generally, the relationship between psychoanalysis and architecture itself, a relationship often suppressed in ways that analysts and architects remain fascinated with. Um, her articles beginning in the mid-1980s examine the work of many contemporary architects, and in fact some of Sylvia's earliest writings are on the architects of the moment of that era, people like Michael Graves and others who she was working nearby, um, and in a certain way she's coming full circle in this latest body of work to rethink or re-examine that topic of the contemporary in architecture. I think in about 1990, Sylvia publishes an article that I hope many of you remember, titled The Uses and Abuses of Theory, which, <coughs> which led to many um, responses in many different forms, and I think more than anything put the topic of theory as it was emerging in those years, now 15 years ago or so, um, at the forefront of a discussion that very many people carry forward today in different formats. I think Sylvia's great insight was to uh, 
have seen that long before our most contemporary architects today would have imagined that as a topic. Um, <coughs> as a scholar, a theorist, an analyst, and an educator, Sylvia lives and works in Los Angeles where in addition to all of her writing um, over the years, she has been the chair of the Department of Architecture at UCLA, a position she is just, just now stepping away from and during those years I think really very much shaped one of the truly important and interesting schools of architecture anywhere in the world um, and is now stepping away from to pursue her activities as a writer and a scholar. Please join me in welcoming Sylvia Levin. one do I need to worry about? That one. Okay. All right. Well, as they say, enough about me. Um, except, I hope, I gather that somebody has made a black Lego model of my soon-to-be house. Does everybody here know about this? No. Nope. Uh, somebody has done, is, and, well anyway, apparently a student here at the school has done the Slavin House all out of black Legos, and I'm desperate to see it, so I hope you will present yourself to me so I can um, uh, see, what it looks like when, see what it looks like when it's not hot pink. Um, all right, so I'm, th I'm thinking that this is on, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, all right, well, th Brett, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, great introduction. I, I am. I have one problem, which is I really am an academic. I write my texts down. I have to be able to read them. <laughs> I probably should get some chip embedded, but I haven't figured out how to do that. Anyway, thank you very much for for all those kind words and for having me back here. Um, you're going to show me a light. Yes. Oh, there. The light. <laughs> the light. Ooh, it glows. Okay, yeah, glowing, glowing is good. I like glow. That's great. Um, uh, yes, and um, it's funny, uh, gee, some of those long lost, forgotten sins of mine, I haven't thought about them in a long time. Uh, but coming back here did remind me uh, of the fact that I think my very first public speaking engagement as a graduate student was here at the AA. Um, in a response to some diatribe or other that Robert Venturi had just made about something or other. And it was more or less about the time that Prince Charles had just referred to the soon to be built uh, addition to the British Museum as a carbuncle. And um, in addition to having had to scurry to the library to look up what a carbuncle was, um, which I think is just an elegant British way of saying what we Americans, vulgar Americans, call a zit, am I, I believe is the case. Um, but this, uh, you may not remember, but this, uh, this carbuncle comment really created a fuss, um, not because anybody particularly disagreed, by the way, I think a lot of people did think it was a carbuncle, um, but they found it to be a very rude thing to say to an architect. And to have somebody who presumably didn't necessarily know that much feel at liberty to make such a comment to somebody who was otherwise in his own field considered to be an important person. And I take that to be an indication of the status that architecture had in the cultural imaginary and the cultural landscape of that era. And it was pretty low. It was as low as a carbuncle. And I think that as a point of departure, um, we can say that that's very different than the status that architecture has today and the kind of cultural capital that it can um, provoke. Um, I should uh, preliminarily apologize to Rem. He's just such an easy target for this kind of thing. But he's not really any more special on this than anybody else. But if you look carefully at the mob lecture scene, uh, which was actually a lecture up uh, at UCLA, uh, you, see the, you see the back of Rem's head um, talking to Martha Stewart. Um, and with the hat on the left is Brad, 
my stock was never higher at UCLA than on that night, not just because we engineered having all these people here, but because Brad sat next to me in the audience during Rem's lecture, and his knee touched mine. So <laughs> this literal brush with celebrity just uh, was a big deal. Anyway, and Brad is talking to Michael York, and it, we could just continue picking our way through the kind of mobilization of a certain form of cultural power. Um, Lindsay, um, at the opening of the LA Prada flagship, standing, uh, standing just near one of the wells that looks down on the sort of naked mannequin, and Brad, uh, yeah, at Rem's office. And of course, you know, the result of this kind of uh, intimacy between architects and celebrity culture produces at times some identity confusion. Uh, the house that Brad built, I, it seems very unlikely to me that he built this house, maybe, I don't know. Um, uh, I'm full of anecdotes tonight, uh, but I think of the AA as an anecdote kind of place, so I'll tell you one more anecdote. Uh, I was once sitting in my office um, uh, and picked up the phone, and I think I have never been closer to passing out at just saying hello, because it was Marlon Brando. <laughs> And it really was Marlon Brando, um, who had designed a, you know, series of houses for his island in Tahiti. So he was calling me as an architect, wanting to hire a student to draw up his architecture. And of course, she, she in fact, I sent somebody over and he received her in bed um, and made her sign all kinds of, um, you know, security, confidentiality uh, issues, which she kept, so I can't tell you any more than that. But at any rate, so there's a kind of, uh, you know, the, the images of the, the way architecture operates as a form of cultural power today is really quite impressive. Um, I don't know whether it's here yet, it just the premiere was last night in the States, top design. You know, first we had Project Runway, then we had Top Chef, now we have Top Design, um, and the, you know, the guru is Todd Oldham, and anyway, I was at a conference recently at Yale, um, where Bob Stern had Goyle, this Yale architecture graduate, could be you, right, practically on a leash, introducing him to everybody, look at our most successful recent grad, uh, who was on this top design show um, and indicated that he got voted off fairly early, so I'm not sure uh, what that means. Okay, but so there, architecture is popular, let's say. Maybe successful isn't the right word. Ar architecture has a popularity today that it did not have in the era of the carbuncle. And I think thinking through the forms of that popularity is something that we haven't done enough of. And one good indication of that is the way the field responds to Gary. Um, because everybody loves Gary except architects, right? Everybody thinks that the Bilbao effect is the greatest achievement of architecture. I mean, imagine that somebody would ever have ascribed an entire restructuring of the fiscal and uh, ethnic uh, conditions of a nation state to give that to architects. Everybody thinks that except us. Um, probably with some justification, I suppose, uh, you know, this is one of those bits and pieces of a Gary model, which you now buy in sterling silver at Tiffany's. And uh, uh, Frank will, in fact, uh, is already a wealthy man, but he will die an exceedingly wealthy man because of what happens uh, through Tiffany, the sales of the Tiffany jewelry. And literally what happens is that once every six months, Tiffany reps come to the office, they take pictures, and they go back and they make the jewelry. He has absolutely very little to do with it. But at any rate, we're, we're uncomfortable with this kind of success. And, and I would uh, suggest that uh, we're sort of pre, our generation, my generation, your generation, I don't know how different our, we are generationally yet, um, is preconditioned in some way to expect the worst of architecture. 
If you look at the history of modern art, say post-1968 art, one of the most common themes in all of that artistic production, basically from minimalism on, was a kind of attack on the architectural object as though it were synonymous with all forms of institutional uh, problems, uh, basically identifying the object of architecture with capital itself. So this is, I mean, I could show you lots of examples. I could show you endless examples. This one happens to be Dennis on, uh, Oppenheim, this famous uh, video installation of a hand literally beating a white wall. Um, Gordon Matta Clark is, you know, another interpretation of Gordon Matta Clark would be as a kind of acting out of a collective rage against some particular form of architectural interpretation. This continues in the work of very young contemporary artists. This is Monica Bonvicini, um, uh, a, a very successful up and comer. This is a plaster uh, drywall floor. Um, and over the course of the, of the installation, I mean, it has been installed in different places, but over the course of the installation, it literally comes apart. Um, this one is, uh, this is a final photograph by Gregory Crutzen. Um, but if you know his work, you know that the, one of the most prevalent themes in all of his photographic oeuvre is, a, is the use of architecture as a kind of bad object. Something bad is happening inside, happening to it, happening around it. Architecture is a sort of evil, uh, an, an evil force. Um, and as a backstory, it's not just Gregory who thinks this. You know, he, he's um, well known for these incredibly elaborate productions. You know, this one still photograph is much more like a, f a f made like a film with a huge crew and lots and lots of people and massive amounts of post-production work and so forth. But at any rate, he cited, he, um, uh, he had crews go out and look for sites to do this burning house thing. And he came across this little town and asked the mayor and the fire chief, do you have a building I can burn? And they said, actually, we have lots of buildings you can burn. Take your pick. Um, and yeah, so they started burning it down. Um, so at any rate, we, we, have, we are preconditioned in some way to accept this view of architecture um, as, uh, um, as uh, pro problematic, let's say, in the contributions it can make. Um, this is not Gregory Kreutz, and this is Katrina. And despite the fact that we have this a kind of innate pessimism, we also have fantastically high expectations of the field that somehow it's going to be architecture that is going to resolve the problems of Katrina. And we don't much deal with what happens when architects do go into places like Katrina. This is some new urbanist something. So, you know, we, we want to fix this, but then this is what we do. I don't think any but of us feel so great about it. Or then when you look at organizations that really are, say, changing the Afghanistan refugee center into uh, um, habitable housing, whatever you think of it architecturally, it's also very problematic, at least for me, to find out that all of those uh, uh, Habitat for Humanity and so on and so forth, they're all religious groups. It's all totally proselytizing. And the idea that you're going to use the architecture as a guise to send Christians out to Muslim, okay, so that now you're back to you don't want to go there either, right? Or I don't. So somehow um, we are still caught in a moment in which we have a lot of fantasies about what architecture's capacity might be, but don't really know what how architecture can intervene, and I think are terrified of the fact that maybe it's not an architectural problem, it's a problem of the shovel, of actually going and doing something. Uh, um, presumably, you don't teach shovel here, right? So we have a, this is a, this is a disconnect that has to be worked out. Um, if it turns out that these other crises, the crises of uh, Afghanistan, let's say, the crisis of Katrina, are political crises and not architectural crises, then you have to start to look at how architecture has engaged with politics. At least in the 20th century, uh, the tradition doesn't bode well as a model for uh, reproducing today, I don't think. Um, 
I still think it's not a good model when architects enter the political arena. I don't think it's good for politics, and I don't think it's good for architecture. I think that there is something called disciplinary specificity. And when you get out of what you know that you're good at doing, it turns to shit, right? I don't think this is a good model either. This is Brad in New Orleans. I mean, I, do, I don't know whether you guys study uh, uh, Renaissance architecture well enough to, to understand that this is the exact replica of how the Pope poses at the top of St. Peter's as he speaks to his flock. Okay, so we got a lot of people moving around from one field to the other, flirting with architecture, flirting with power, and in fact, none of these flirtations turn into, there's like no, no act is consummated in all of these flirtations. It seems to me to be producing a lot of frustration instead. Except, I don't know, you know, I think Bono is a tough, I, I find it a little bit hard to make fun of Bono. It's way easy to make fun of some of these other figures, but uh, I'm sure somebody here will help me ridicule him because I, I feel as though I have, a, you know, it's just my inclination to want to do that. Um, but, uh, you know, this is making a huge amount of money um, for things that really need uh, the money to be spent on. So as a kind of um, symbol of popular culture and its engagement with world crises, um, Bono, at this point, is pretty much as good a one as I can think of. And one of the things that he said, I'm going to now really get to the architectural point, I promise. Um, one of the things that Bono said about this is, and I'm quoting him, it's sexy to want to change the world. Okay, so uh, the successful model then would be somehow by making this uh, desire to change the world sexy. And the question becomes, can architecture do sexy? Does it do sexy well? What does architecture do with that tradition or with that impulse, let's say? And uh, as a point of departure, I'll just uh, um, make a small observation about what is increasingly becoming known as the PS1 generation. Um, all of these sort of, sort of young, they're youngish uh, designers who have come close to winning the PS1 competition or have in fact won it. This is um, Kivi Sotoma's uh, uh, proposal, which in fact did not win. And one of the things about this year, um, th uh, this was last year, but the, uh, it, last year in my opinion there were s some very, very good proposals and a not good one won. Um, and I'm curious about how uh, an institution that likes to think of itself as knowing better can make such an incredible error. Um, one of the things that Alana uh, Heiss, who's the director of PS1, said about these projects, and I'm quoting again, all the proposals were extraordinarily seductive. And you can imagine, you can hear in her voice, but, right, so there's something about architecture and seduction that somehow doesn't go well. And you can see what she means by uh, the seductiveness, it has to do with the color, it has to do with the, the shapefulness of it, uh, it has to do with the way color is reflected one uh, surface off the other so that the color becomes ambient in some kind of way. These are all uh, sort of traditional definitions of uh, um, uh, traditional techniques, let's say, of the erotic in design. This is another one of the losers. This is uh, New Forms uh, Purple Haze Project. And, um, you know, when you look at them, I, I think that whatever your tastes and inclinations are, you can read them as seductive, whereas this one, that one, I would just call shady, right? Um, uh, okay, so how, so how does that happen? And if we are put, the, put all of these things together to try to say that seduction should be a device that architecture can use to help contribute to the idea of making it sexy to want to change the world, you go from something that seems apparently frivolous and ridiculous to actually trying to create a cultural climate in which the qualities of architecture foment the kind of action that you would feel was responsible.
So I'm going to now shift into what uh, Brett was describing as my narrow analytic uh, mode and talk a little bit about the historical and contemporary iterations of this inability to deal with seductiveness in architecture. And I'll just start, uh, it's kind of an aside, I suppose, but with this picture of um, Frank Sinatra who was arrested in 1938, as you can see, this is his mugshot for criminal seduction in Hackensack, New Jersey, uh, which I found to be totally fascinating. I, I didn't know that. And I realized it made the idea of seduction just seem all the more seductive that somehow he had gotten arrested for this. And um, I wasn't sure whether it's because there's the whole, you know, there's always something alluring about the criminal element, you know, the girls that like bad boys, there's maybe that. Uh, whether it's because he just looks in the language of the late 1920s dreamy in this uh, photograph, uh, at any rate. Um, but what, but I, what I will tell you is that it suggests that seduction is all like beauty, like, tr like, like the tradition of aesthetic thinking is all in the eye of the beholder, or in this case, the eye of the accuser. Because it, it turns out what it meant to have committed criminal seduction was to have had sex with a virginal young woman on the promise of marrying her. That's what was wrong. Except it turned out that the woman in question was already married to somebody else. <laughs> so he was set free, and she was arrested instead for <laughs> adultery. OK, so we got some uh, category mistakes to work out here, uh, which I hope I'll do by turning to some old and some new uh, uh, images for you. Um, you're looking at, I'm going to be talking about the figure in the lower, uh, your lower left, uh, whose name is John Pierce. He was an architect, one of these uh, highfalutin fancy graduates of Yale. Um, he graduated in 1965, and you see him here jumping up and down with uh, the guys from Davis Brody <coughs> on the, yeah, who knew they could jump? They're so stiff, you know? Um, but they're jumping up and down on the roof of the U.S. Pavilion uh, at the 1970 Osaka World's Fair. Okay, so when John Pierce uh, graduated from Yale, he went to work for the outgoing Dean Paul Rudolph, assuming responsibility for the building of the Biltons of Rudolph's New York apartment. There's something intimate about Biltons. They're where your stuff gets hidden, where your hidden things get stuffed, and they are themselves often hidden. Originally meant to eliminate the dark hiding places created by freestanding furniture, built-ins began as instruments of emancipation from the secretive Victorian interior. They contained things, but they belonged to the logic of the transparent surface. By mid-century, on the other hand, built-ins had become a technique for making things disappear. The proliferating objects of consumer culture led to a new type of amour vacui in which the surface functioned as a disguise. Such post-war built-ins turned Adolf Loos's mandate that public facades be blank so that interiors could be expressive, inside out, and upside down. Unlike the man suit, Loos argued buildings should implacably wear on the outside, buildings, uh, built-ins hug a building's intimate inside parts like nude underwear that are precisely neither proper nor expressive, but confounding and alluring. Without panty lines, or what you architects would call visible hardware, legible contours, I call them panty lines, built-ins perform a disappearing act in which even the presence of secrets vanishes into the woodwork, or in this case, the shag carpet. Uh, this is Rudolph's bedroom. Um, yeah. There was a lot that was hidden in Rudolph's apartment, most notably his lover, who slid in and out of a built-in closet built into a house almost entirely built of built-ins. Um, they are never labeled correctly on the drawings. You probably know all of this already. I don't need to tell you what you already know. But this, the library, sometimes it's called the library, but his, you know, Rudolph was a military man, always with a crew cut and so forth. And he was, um, 
uh, he was so, his homosexuality was so closeted that he literally made a kind of metal closet in which, uh, in which his uh, lover lived. Indeed, by the 70s, the pressure of this secret exploded the apartment into a dazzling display of too much to see, a visibility so extreme that they supercharged the viewer into a momentary state of ultravision, able to see more, able to see that the built-ins proliferated until they became the thing itself. The apartment is less a building than a pile of built-ins. Much of Rudolph's work of the 60s is best understood as an accumulation of decor that rubs up against architecture's limits, like underwear. If you look closely at this, it happens to be the Elman apartment in New York. If you look closely at it, you can see that the, um, uh, the coffee tables are mirrored on the sides so that they reflect the shag carpet. So you get this, uh, you get a, uh, the same with the bottoms of the chairs and so forth. So you get this super confounding, let's say, rather than legible system of surfaces. Uh, this decor swallows up uh, ar uh, architecture's walls and makes building as such, its tectonics, volumes, and logic disappear. Pierce, to whom I shall return in a moment, is a symptom still hidden within the folds of the architecture that emerged from this decor that began with built-ins, but that quickly moved into other forms of continuous, opaque, voluminous, and enveloping surface, the endless and thick piles of conversation pits and shag carpets, patterned and faceted shiny plastic, twinkling and twirling mylar discs that made images dance. Architecture delaminated from the medium of building, architecture not obligated to the logic of the visible and verifiable, the only logic in which secrets can thrive, an architecture that instead sought to constitute itself through impressions, mirages, and temptations, and that offered not the abstractions of optical scenes, but rather the sensation of dense haptic experience. In 1963, Carlo Molino discovered Polaroid photography. He had always been interested in photography, printing, retouching, signing, and exhibiting his pictures often concerned with the spectacle of vision, and had published in 49 Message from the Darkroom, an early history of photography to, to focus on the photographer's capacity to falsify images. But Molino's encounter with the Polaroid released a fetish, quite an accomplishment for someone already overcome by various fetishes, from race cars to aerial skiing. This is the, his own car that he designed and made and raced in Le Mans. And, you know, he was an aerial skier. There are these incredible pictures of him upside down and, you know, basically drawing in the air with his skis. And, I mean, the guy was a total certified nut. But upon his death, over 2,000 pornographic Polaroids were discovered hidden in a drawer, taken of local prostitutes, each dressed up and posed inside Molino's house. Unsigned and unframed, Molino died unexpectedly. There is no evidence to suggest he ever intended these images to be seen. While the women came from the streets, Molino photographed them in the private world he designed around them. He costumed the girls, buying outfits in several sizes, not sure how big the girls would be that he would happen to find on any particular occasion. Some of the dresses he, ordered, he mail ordered from Paris. This dress by Paco Rabanne, an architect who left architecture for the more commercial and, like the Polaroid, more immediate and disposable world of fashion, was most likely purchased here, in nearby Milan, in a shop called Altre Cose, designed by Ugo La Pietra, also an ex-architect, a future member of Global Tools, in this boutique that, like the women in Molino's Polaroids who were visible for the moment of the camera's flash, but who quickly receded into a secret drawer, remains invisible to our understanding of the formation of contemporary architecture. In 1963, Andy Warhol began looking for a new workspace, and in January of 64, moved into a derelict building on East 47th Street. He invited Billy Linich, better known as Billy Name, to cover the space in tin foil and aluminum industrial paint, which Warhol had first seen in Billy's downtown apartment. It is said that Billy was inspired by the periodic repainting of the Mid-Hudson Bridge near his family home in Poughkeepsie. But of course, there are many possible sources from Richard Neutra, 
who you know not only painted all wood uh, that he could get his hands on with aluminum paint, um, but he also did things like make eye beams out of uh, plywood. So he would laminate the plywood so it would look like an eye beam and then paint it aluminum, even though there was no such thing as an aluminum eye beam. You know, totally confusing. Um, but also uh, to Isamu Noguchi whose own downtown studio was painted with aluminum paint at the suggestion of Buckminster Fuller. But while the architectural precedents emphasized the aluminum in the paint, as if to suggest thereby that the painted surface should really be understood as made of metal, and therefore as able to confer the status of metal construction, the Warhol world read the aluminum paint and the tin foil indiscriminately as silver. This is Warhol reflected in the silver wall. Not silver as a material, as an architect would understand the concept. None of the things Warhol associated with the color of the factory, astronaut suits, the silver screen, and mirrors were actually made of silver in 1963. Instead, the silver was a quality, the effect of which, particularly because exaggerated by stage lights, was to animate the interior and to make the ambiance of the factory itself a machine for producing endless and moving images. As if to emphasize the nature of this apparition environment, a disco ball, the quintessential proliferator and environmental diffuser of serial images, sat on the floor. The pictures produced by and in this environment were not stuffed in a drawer. Someone was usually dressing or undressing or dressing up, and someone else was likely to be having sex for the camera. The door was generally left open. Nothing was hidden. Everything and everyone was all too visible. Except tellingly, one key element remains historically obscured. The factory is iconic in the history of art from many points of view, except that of architecture. No doubt because it lacks the characteristics of building, does not rely on instruments of architectural representation, is too decorative, cannot claim an architect as author, is insufficiently deliberate, and proceeds to produce its impact on the world merely through the proliferation of images and ambient effects. The one thing hidden in and by the factory was its architecture, as if the actual building was outshadowed by Warhol's virtual one. Nevertheless, the silver factory had an architecture. It belongs to the factory as building type in place of manufacture, as environment, as design space of events and social practices. What distinguishes the silver factory is how it belonged to architecture, because it produced the effect of architecture without the medium of building and without the officiations of an architect. It was made by covering up the building with visual performance and unadulterated by pretext. There were no built-ins or secret cache of photos to justify the extra silver lining. It was a purely supercharged surface for a new possible architecture. As worlds apart as the clean-cut Yale grad and the, the mad race car driver from Turin may have seemed when I began, as distinct as the problems of medium and discipline that these mylar discs, acrylic tubes, and sparkling tinfoil pose, they demonstrate how architecture found in the animated reflective surface, the surface without depth in which things can hide but with excess dazzle, the surface that produces vivid but unmemorable images, in unbounded environments held together by qualities rather than by legible limits, in architecture supercharged, the means to rewrite the discipline's rules of attraction. It's not just that queerness or fetish or voyeurism came out of the closet. Nothing so legitimizing as that. Indeed, most of this decorative, ephemeral, commercial, and frivolous architecture is still quite illegitimate. To consider it today is not to argue that it had historical importance that's been neglected. Rather, it's contemporary architecture, and you could start to make an, a massive uh, collection of uh, ant what I would consider antecedents for this historical work. Um, uh, this, obviously, this is the BMW. Um, this is a project by Servo uh, Nike Showroom. Um, this is a United Architects uh, Bubbles and Wine show, I think, uh, on these silver uh, mylar weather balloons. Um, this is a detail of a uh, project, I believe, under construction, an FOA project uh, surface of this building. 
Um, so it's this architecture, this contemporary architecture that is producing this historical architecture that needs this architecture or this almost architecture of 1963 to help it outsmart those currents within architectural thinking that insist on an equivalence between architecture and building, that still believe in the functionalist fallacy and deeply fear being intoxicated by the immersive spectacle of intense architectural provocation. The limits these doxa impose form the core of a still prevalent critical discourse. Adolf Loos's criminalization of ornament, he had this kind of thing in mind, it looks an awful lot like FOA, and the sexuality he feared it could unleash, and Tafuri's condemnation of operative criticism as the handmaiden of the false promises of capitalism, echo in an architectural discourse that continues to enforce a quasi-juridical system of norms against temptation, persuasion, and pleasure. Today, the perception of who or is seducing what or whom has changed, but the injunctions against such enticement persist. According to Hal Foster, for example, architecture is not Tafuri's innocent in need of protection, but a dangerous siren who, particularly when appearing in a voluptuous body, an insufficiently modernist body, in a shape that Foster, with what I would call impressive critical precision, calls wacky, is likely to lead the world to a state of total orgiastic indulgence. Architecture's attachment to these interdictions is only partially the result of the development of modern aesthetics, which historically speaking is predicated on the separation of beauty from beauty's capacity to arouse. From the moment that Winkelmann's frankly erotic reading of young white boys became a writing of ideal standards of abstract form, when Kant informed us that aesthetic appreciation of grapes could be demonstrated only by not feeling hungry, even at their most luscious depiction, when Greenberg disparaged kitsch as overly abetting desire, any inadequate suppression of appetite any soupçon of feeling wedded has been understood as evidence of weakness in the critic. But only in architecture has the complex intimacy between desire and beauty been so actively opposed that transgression demanded outright criminalization, making critics in and of our field the strictest hall monitors always on the lookout for infraction. Modern aesthetics distinguish beauty from allure, but only architectural theory is made against any and all forms of arousal. As a result, the architect keeps a prophylactic nearby so that things don't go too far. Um, this, is the, this is a section of the uh, interior renovation of Alice Tully Hall being done by Diller and Scafidio, um, in which they were given a nine inch a span, uh, they could only operate on a nine inch uh, surface um, for which they developed a kind of latex impregnated wood um, and the whole thing works exactly like uh, a female condom um, in, and I think that in some way that's a, an important thing to think about their whole intervention at Lincoln Center. It's a little bit like an architecture that just doesn't go too far. So architects keep condoms handy, just as any good critic of architecture must never show signs of having been seduced, even by the idea of seduction. But if allowing yourself to succumb to the wiles of seduction makes you operative, according to Tafuri, it follows that avoiding seduction makes you inoperative. And here are the, dif the dictionary definitions of inoperative. Not functioning properly, not effective or no longer valid, out of action, out of order, out of use, broken, broken down. I think that should be the end of the anxiety about operative criticism. In 1963, Bernard Rudofsky started work on what became architecture without architects. Peter Eisenman has been known to refer to some of his colleagues as architects without architecture. A category more tragic and comic than Rudofsky's, but nevertheless defined by similar distinctions between architecture as discipline and profession. I'm considering architecture without building, or as if architecture, 
Under the premise that it's the heaviness of building, its duration, cost, monumentality, and other afflictions that are not the cause of, but rather that have been used as cover for this tradition of interdiction. La Pietra's altre cose is one victim of these taboos, of the field's unwillingness or inability to see certain kinds of supercharged images as architecture. The store was published in leading design magazines, and La Pietra achieved prominence in the 60s because of his disequilibriating system, that's what he called it, one component of which was the inclined plane. Uh, you see one of his, uh, I think this is 67, an inclined plane plane project installed uh, in the square in, in front of the Milan Cathedral. Um, unlike the fonction oblique of Claude Perron, who always thought on a monumental scale, La Pietra's work focused on micro-environments that manipulated light and sound to interrupt habitual sensory experience. Given current interest in this type of research of the late 1960s, only resistance to his boutique's frivolous lack of allegiance to the properties of building explains why Altre Cose has not entered the record as one of the few built examples of experimental design of the neo-avant-garde period, but lurks around still like an embarrassing proclivity. But Altre Cose wasn't shy. It's look up your skirt, Peekaboo point of view toward the theater and sociality of shopping is more brazen than many current approaches to the architecture of fashion. And in some ways, you might consider it more fashionable in its relationship to fashion, um, which would be another discussion. Entry to Altre Cose was disequilibriating and took place either through doors that opened electronically along opposing diagonal vectors or more properly, in an early example of what the Italians call contaminated programming, from the Bang Bang nightclub below, through an acrylic elevator that carried two people up along an inclined track. Uh, you see them coming up <laughs> over there on your right. The main space was densely filled with acrylic columns suspended from the ceiling that contained clothing, much made of the same material that laminated the store. Uh, several of the, many of the walls had these sliding panels drilled in these optical patterns. Uh, the, the actual acrylic sheets were pre-production um, sheets for making uh, buttons. So the buttons and everything is sort of made out of the same uh, kind of stuff. Shoppers selected items from a computer console, illuminated once in descent, the cylinders mingled with shoppers to produce a crowd of girls in dresses and dresses without girls, which was phantasmagorically doubled by a rear mirror wall. The status of this design as an invisibly architectural proposal can be calibrated by considering the scheme's obvious reference to Teranyi's Danteum. Both are divided into three levels, are organized around a circuit that ascends from darkness to light, and conclude in a hypostyle hall of transparent columns. Um, this is one of those hideous MIT VR things. You'll, you'll pardon. I, I, I should be committed somehow for even showing such a thing, but what was I going to do? Uh, but La Pietra's paraphrase utterly evacuates the heavy, not to say onerous, poetic and architectural content of the Teranyi and uses this forcefully emptied out container as something to fill with a gas made of an infinite number of agitated particles. At every turn where in the Teranyi there was sacred geometry, hermeneutic interpretation and narrative purpose, there is instead random events, movement, spectacle and distortion. Indeed, Gilo Dorfles understood La Pietra to have suppressed traditional forms of content by deliberately manufacturing noise. Uh, yeah, he, he was meaning uh, the noise of these patterns and the noise of these people have these noisemaker heads, uh, helmets on their heads. And one of the reasons that the store was located next to the bang, uh, over the Bang Bang Club was so that the store was always pulsing with the noise that, that bled through the floor below. Germano Chalant maintained that this noise increased the aesthetic impact of La Pietra's work by distracting the viewer from any single sense and encouraging him or her to feel multiple components of the sensory apparatus fire at the same time. And according to Domus, Architects like Paco Rabanne uh, or Khazar Khan, 
who made inflatable buildings, and I couldn't find a picture of his inflatable clothes, but this is a contemporary inflatable dress, so you get the idea. And La Pietra, oh, you know what? Here was my side. I thought I, was, I didn't bring it, bring it in. Um, you know, there's this big show on right now in LA. Uh, the entire Museum of Contemporary Art is devoted to this thing, fashion and architecture. Um, uh, it was, which is called Skin and Bones, I had an eerily, it was eerily reminiscent of um, uh, the Dover Street Market here, very similar kind of thing. Um, but anyway, maybe a topic of conversation for tomorrow might be what that show is about and what, it, what it's like. And, and I think that I would argue that it has a lot of clothes and couture and a lot of buildings, but absolutely nothing that is fashionable. It has no sense of what that might mean. And the, the art critics of the late 1960s were arguing that it was these architects and their boutique designs that were actually going to make fashion, not clothing, but fashion, fashionable by making it become responsive, by making it become environmental, by making it learn from the multiplicities of the urban environment, noise, distraction, behavioral confusion, and so forth. So for Chalant, the intersection between fashion, architecture, and the work of La Pietra created a new category of aesthetic experience, which he called, with all due attention to its oxymoronic impossibility, useful pleasure, piacevolezza fruitiva, the utility derived from the environmental capacity of clothing and architecture, they could be worn and used. Um, uh, the piacevolezza came from visually animated design. But the active immersion in an environment of multiple character, both useful and pleasing, was for Chalant exponentially pleasurable. The noisy ambience produced consumers who participated not through the traditional solitary contemplation of a distant aesthetic object, but rather in terms of epicentric and communal excitement. For Chalant, in other words, a place like Altre Cose was itself a turn on, perhaps nowhere more so than in the dressing room, uh, which for those of you who uh, speak Italian, a dressing room in Italian is actually an undressing room. It's a spogliatoio. It's not where you get dressed. It's where you take your clothes off. They tend to be communal. There's no private stalls. You're in there. Everybody's stripping right next to everybody, all uh, collected together, a room that is made with sparkly angle surfaces. They're, you can't get away either from your own naked body or the, uh, the other people in there. Um, let's call this a kind of silver fashion factory, this immersive kaleidoscopic uh, interior turns out to be the place where the difference between Molino's hookers shoved in a drawer and a new generation of architectural users seeking piacevolezza seems to collapse. Architecture has traditionally not had a good place to put such appetites, ergo the drawers, the secret built-ins, the forgotten projects, and so forth. And indeed, the history of, po of the post-war era is not just the one being written with strict attention to the righteous work of Constant or the fundamentalist work of Superstudio, a history of steadfast refuseniks of commerce and commodity, but the unwritten history of a new generation of users who had LSD and birth control, as it were, and who wanted architecture to be an element of their intoxication. Pierce's first independent architectural job remains caught in precisely this doubly binded history in the effort both to find the architecture of this emerging culture of users as well as the attempt to make sure that such efforts never contaminated architecture proper. In 1963, post-war baby boomers became the dominant force in the commercial economy of the United States. Pepsi claimed them with the slogan, come alive, you're in the Pepsi generation, identifying a product for the first time in advertising history, not by its attributes, but by its consumers' lifestyles. Architecture, as it too expanded beyond its conventional attributes, was to play a significant role in internationalizing Pepsi's campaign. After building Rudolph's built-ins, Pierce became the architect in charge of the effort to make the Pepsi generation come alive in Japan. This Pepsi pavilion, produced by the group of artists and engineers known as EAT, Experiments in Art and Technology, for the 1970 Osaka Expo, is very well known to historians of post-war art, but is virtually unknown to architecture. The pavilion does not appear in a single standard history of modern architecture, including the critical ones, as far as I am aware. 
The Osaka Pavilion was a multimedia extravaganza in the triple-shelled rotunda. A fog dome on the exterior, a sort of bucky dome acting as shell and structure, and an inner mirror dome that produced inverted holographic images. That's how it's built. Stewardesses led visitors through a tunnel to a below ground unlit room where everyone was given a handset before moving back up into the main space. The floor above was divided into seven sections, each made of different materials that corresponded to a piece of pre-recorded sound, and every hand unit interacted through 37 speakers and coils in the floor. The system, by which I mean uh, the computerized sound, lighting, and live performances relied on visitor movement to trigger feedback that created auditory and optical hallucinations. There was nothing particular to do once you were here, no circulation path to follow inside the dome, but as visitors milled around, they both had and made for others an experience in which, like the one in Altre Cose, multiple sources of visual and auditory st stimulation created an intense but unfocused kinesthetic and always shifting environment. While its technical virtuosity and performance program explains why the project is canonic in the history of intermedia art, it doesn't explain why it has no status at all in relation to architecture. According to EAT's director, Billy Kluver, only the architects saved the project from being a disastrous free-for-all. Furthermore, the single most obvious thing that can be said about the pavilion is that it's a pavilion. Not even the conventional apparatus of a building, offices, uh, etc., not even a licensed architect with an Ivy, Ivy League uh, degree made it visible as an architect. No member of EAT considered the pavilion an architectural project. Pierce said, these guys didn't even seem to realize they were really building a building. Pierce, on the other hand, didn't think much of the building as such either, describing his own function as freeing up the artists to be artists by making the toilets disappear. That it was a building distracted everyone, including the architect, from developing a theory of architecture adequate to the project, which would have entailed a theory of architecture concerned with the pavilion's qualities rather than its buildinghood, with the result that today, like Bellino's Polaroids and Rudolph's decors, the Pepsi Pavilion needs to be actively seduced into a reconfigured understanding of architectural disciplinarity. Uh, okay, so the first step in, uh, uh, in this seduction starts with uh, noting uh, EAT's decision to make a fully spherical mirror dome. That decision began with a scheme that, uh, that was basically modeled after go-go dancers. They imagined having go-go dancers standing on go-go platforms with mirrorized small tops and transparent bottoms. So you would look up at the dancer, another peekaboo up her skirt, so to speak, or hot pants, whatever they would have been wearing, and you would then see the dancer dancing with herself reflected upside down in the mirror. Um, this idea proved so seductive that rather than limit the experience to an audience peeping up at girls in a booth, the mirror was unfurled, draped around the crep. Oh, you don't want to hear the, the models, the, the preliminary models were actually these inflatables, and that's, um, that's a clip of one of them being inflated. Um, so it was like this silver curtain um, that extended through its curvature to visual completeness, a universe without limiting edges, entrancing all vision into peripherality. Not only the, did the decision to silverize the pavilion eliminate the program of dancers and the iconography of Pepsi, you know, there was a lot of discussion, should you be allowed to drink Pepsi in the Pepsi pavilion, et cetera? The answer was no, and instead they turned everybody into Barbarellas, free floating around in an ambiguously bounded environment, creating what Jean Youngblood described, and I quote, an, as an astonishing, spectacular, radiantly sensuous, transcendentally surrealistic giant mirror womb, end quote. Gene Youngblood is the guy that wrote Expanded Cinema in Prano. Now his, his choice of the word womb is of course loaded, uh, but let's just focus for a moment on, on, on uh, the curvature of wombs, they're always round, and on the fact that they are temporary environments that emerge in relation to the birth of a new appetite. 
The connection to Warhol's factory is evident, even if you didn't know that Kluver worked with Warhol, say, on the Silver Clouds, or the fact that EAT used to meet with the Pepsi reps at the Electric Circus, of which you see an image here of the exploding plastic inevitable. But the pavilion extends the silver factory into an even more counterintuitive space for production, from factory to artificial womb, with an even more extreme erasure of building. In the factory, corners, plumbing, structural beams, while silverized, were nevertheless visible. This is the silver toilet. Not only is the pavilion memberless, its curvature creates the illusion of a complete world of fluid and unstructured affect, where the constantly agitated reflections that seem to be the constituent elements of the space lend the whole evanescence. According to Youngblood, the mirror's effect, and I quote, was overwhelming. Phantasmagorias of color and light whirl insanely about the environment, but environment is inadequate to describe this place. It's there and it's not there, end quote. Everyone seems to have had a hard time hanging on to an image of the pavilion. Robert Rauschenberg, for example, called the pavilion an invisible environment. Uh, he, he basically thought it was invisible because all of the artists had to abandon their traditional mediums in order to work together. So sculpture, sculptors couldn't do sculpture and painters couldn't do. So the autonomy of the objects became hard to discern. Um, so Youngblood and Rauschenberg found the pavilion perceptually difficult, but it was not hard to see. To the contrary, every available account describes the experience of the pavilion as an overly saturated spectacle. Instead, the difficulty ascribed to seeing the pavilion derived from the fact that it didn't present itself within recognizable disciplinary paradigms. No one had the means to receive this new type of environmental intoxicant. And this is where architecture without building is useful, since one of its most antique functions, and a function widely reactivated in the 1960s and widely being reactivated today, is to provide the place where new forms of experience are shaped and where mediums and disciplines come together to reconfigure themselves. Architecture, in this sense, is the mother of contemporary art in particular, and not just because it has a womb, but because by 1963, it had become the very stage of novelty. The pavilion was more than simply not a building. In detaching from the traditional definitions of medium in general, it passed through the period's investigation of the limits of conventional art forms to find a new type of contemporary architecture, the supercharged environment where optical and auditory noise produce spectacular experience but no legible content. Horizons and contours are suppressed while surfaces are textured, patterned, and reflective, producing an atmospheric perspective or ambiance that makes the reading of bounded volume impossible. With what can thus no longer be considered space in a philosophical sense, a dense accumulation of animated images replaces the traditionally attentive and single viewer with crowdedness and motion. Together, these qualities engender all the effects of architecture without either a building as object or the essentialist positions to which such objects are traditionally attached. The fact that all of this obscure milling about took place within the blur of an actual cloud makes it just about too obvious to bear. But it is surprising that such a wide range of current architectural practices come together in a virtually unknown series of almost architectures from this forgotten period of lustful appetites. Uh, hmm. I'll tell you about him in a second. Um, as is their obligation, contemporary works demand that a new canon or anti-canon be invented so that they can use it as precedent and alibi. The rub is, however, that once these secrets have been wrenched from the drawers in which they have been ensconced, they bring with them their own qualities and provocations. They insist on being discriminated against and having their privacy disturbed in the service of some reasonable cultural project. So is that project one of seduction? This may be an entirely American phenomenon. Do you guys have the seduction movement here? Do you guys have any idea what I'm talking about? So the seduction movement is this, the male version, do you know the, the book of rules? You know how to get a guy to marry you and, you, you know, 
You gotta get with the popular culture, guys. Come on, it's no wonder architecture can't be fashionable if you don't know what the rules are and the, the man of mystery. He's this guy who started this whole incredibly successful um, school to teach these guys how to get dates. And it all has fundamentally to do with insulting the object of your fantasy because somehow insulting her is supposed to make her want to come back and convince you that she's not really as bad as you thought she was. But it's a highly sophisticated psychological, rhetorical um, setup you should go online and, you know, they, they have these clubs, they're called lairs. You know, they sit and lie and wait. And, okay, they like to claim that size doesn't matter. Well, I don't know. Architecture seems to think that it does matter. But I think, uh, I think it is fair to say that we do know, we have learned enough when we began to separate the penis from the phallus that whatever your proclivities, to be seduced is not to be confronted with a thing or a fact, big or small, true or false, but rather is to be carried away by a persuasive fiction. And it is because seduction constitutes one of the three forms of rhetoric, the art of persuasion, that it can be used as a means of discriminating within this diaspora of projects. Forensic rhetoric focuses on the past and uses the language of law and evidence, what some of us might call criti critical language. The Blur Building is first a forensic examination of the limits of the modern culture of enlightenment and an experience second, a close second, but second nevertheless. Uh, the Serpentine was projective, trading on the Pache Rem, always missionary commitment to adjudicating how things should and ought to be in the future. Purple haze is instead seductive, epididetic, and contemporary. It deals only with the present and uses strong color and imagery, in other words, it supercharges form, to establish a mood or feeling vividly enough that it persuades others to feel it too. In their capacity to produce a plausible, effective sensorial ambience, seductions promise that the world will not come to an end, even if it becomes otherwise, even in the face of novelty. There was nothing magical about 1963. To the contrary, contemporary work is conjuring up, making it possible and necessary to see the pavilions shimmer. Uh, this is a housing project for, uh, in uh, Valencia and Warhol Silver, Rudolph's Mylar. This is a Mylar uh, structure uh, uh, built in materials and applications a couple of years ago, and Molino's French Lace. These old works are today's urgings for architecture to behave in ways outside expectation, enticements to accept the idea that architecture can participate in the culture of appetites rather than remain in its traditional role as appetite suppressant and still be architecture. But while some architects are becoming flirtatious, I would call this flirty, they hesitate, as I said when I began, to consummate the act. Self-imposed censorship reintroduces constraints of program and content, of utility without piacevolezza, of decorum, and of familiarity. Architecture is interested in the purple haze, but institutionally reluctant to be seduced. As the basic human rights to appetites are being lost, as the criminalization of abortion, free speech, and other systems of liberty is becoming as rampant in the general culture as it has long since been in architecture, as we are still dealing with the problem of the shovel, it is ever more important to insist that even something as apparently stolid as a building can become new and, be and can become better when seduced into changing its colors. Thank you. Or I can answer them tomorrow. This, these, by the way, are um, a series of works.
uh, by Jim Welling, a contemporary photographer who's done this quite uh, extraordinary series of images of the New Canaan estate. What were those done? Are these recent? Uh, you know, yesterday. Yeah. yeah, they're really now. Thank you so much. I, um, uh, Sylvia, as, as I watched the, at one more moment in the, in the talk, I imagined you delivering this, and, and I'm assuming there are still such places called uh, Departments of Interior Design. One of, the, one of the things that runs through you know, a huge number of the images and the examples you show is, in fact, interiority, or, and not just interior space, whether domestic or other you know, forms of you know, commercial in the terms of the shop or something, but, but, but in fact, interior design itself. And it seems as though what you're, at a certain level, what you're mining, quite literally, is a kind of disciplinary boundary that architecture and architects most certainly have constructed for as many decades in which they've spoken at the other end of the spectrum about architecture and urbanism. In, in your examples, I think what's really quite stunning is the way in which the limit to which architects will look towards the effects, the discourse, the practices of interior design as being within their world at some level. And, well, I, yeah, I mean, I think there, there are two things about that. One is that, um, you know, I do consider, I, I don't really understand why, but, but I do consider the, the architectural field to be fundamentally masochistic and always running around trying to get with people and institutions and other cultural practices that are basically mean to it. And, um, you know, I would say art is the classic example. I mean, you know, when, when was the last time you heard a museum curator say, oh, I love it when architecture gets in the way? I mean, you know, I mean, the, the art world, uh, all, all Frank Gehry ever wanted to be when he grew up was an artist, and all the artists want him to do is get out of their way. So, so and I think the same is true with uh, urban, urban planning and urbanism. Um, you know, uh, in, at UCLA, you know, we have this guy, Ed Soja, who you know now here intimately, right? He spends half of the year now here in London. And a brilliant urban theorist, I mean, incredibly brilliant and fantastic, and one of the most, um, uh, I, like, he's, he's like a serial killer when it comes to architects. He just wants to chop them down one after another. And his animosity towards the field is one of the reasons, and this is, I, it's not special to LA. If you look at the institutions of architecture, ultimately the hatred between architects and urbanists makes schools literally break apart and you get urban planning going off with government and so on and so forth, which, you know, my attitude is, you know, vaya con Dios, go wherever you are happy. Um, but if you're going to give up being a masochist, and trying to become like these cultural practices that are so abusive, um, you can't just give that up. You have to have, an, uh, have a kind of replacement. So there, there are these other cultural practices that all they want to do is be architects. Um, you know, most interior decorating, interior design programs now are desperate to call themselves interior architecture programs. There is a a, you know, an architecture philia, if you will, um, that I think is interesting to explore and to, to look in that direction, I just think is interesting. Um, I also think that those other margins, you, you know, I, I mean, I would say that one of the intellectual projects of the last 50 years has been to mine margins. And by now, the world has reorganized itself around those once marginal questions, and they're now central questions. And one has to, you know, if you want to continue that project, you have to find other margins. And I think that the margins of real fashionability, of the ephemeral, of boutique culture, um, that's still a total taboo. Um, in, in, I think it's still a taboo. And so, so, and that's one of the reasons to do it. I think that the emphasis on interiorness, um, I think that that's a weakness in this part of the presentation. This is part of a book that I'm working on, and in other parts of it, it won't, because it does make it seem as though you could only achieve this if you were working on the scale of a single room and on an interior, which is not my point. So. That's the the other, answer. the other thing you seem to uncover in it is that, in addition to 
interior design or interiority being under discipline to a certain level by certainly by architects and within architecture it's it's also a field that's fascinating in part for being untheorized in a strange way i mean it you mentioned Gila de Flores as someone who's almost, a, I mean, wrote about kitsch but is himself almost a kind of kitsch figure in contemporary or cultural studies. And I think the way in which you can then connect, connect um, theory and practice through the absence in th these kind of projects is a phenomenal kind of uh, discovery th by working through the projects themselves. I mean, th you're left with the kind of the quotes by the designer, but beyond that, there isn't a there isn't a kind of project that's gone through an analysis or work on that work before. I mean, literally decades later, it seems something like Osaka. Or I think it's pretty. Yeah, it's it's all pretty unknown. But then, you know, if you get the Blur Building and Ram Serpentine, it's obviously not unknown mm -hmm. because, I mean, the the Blur Building and the Serpentine are direct. Uh, repetitions in the you know sort of the older sense of the war the, the notion of a repetition of a historical precedent so it mm -hmm. entered architectural consciousness in some way but um, I, you know when Dillard's Cofidio did the blur building they were accused of plagiarism how could they just steal the cloud and not give credit let's say which, which I think is interesting in its total ludicrousness. I mean, first of all, the woman who was the fog sculptress in the Osaka Pavilion was the woman who was the fog sculptress in the Blur Pavilion. So she's not stealing from herself. She's continuing her work. I mean, there's no plagiarism involved in that. And, and, and somehow what made it seem like plagiarism was that we as an architectural community didn't n identify it as a respectable precedent. Therefore, it was a secret that had been stolen some, somehow. Um, and at least in all of the discussion that I read about the serpentine, the idea of having a big inflatable bubble thing that is organized entirely around program, I mean, you know, it's pretty much one-to-one. -one. Um, uh, which again, I don't, I don't say as a, because I think REM is plagiarizing anybody, but I think that there's a whole new series of projects that are in conversation with one another. And it's not just Mies and it's not just Corb anymore. You know, somehow quoting Mies and Corb makes you a good architect. Quoting the Pepsi Pavilion somehow makes you a cheesy plagiarist. Uh, but somewhere in there, there's got to be the potential to innovate and renew what our sense of possibility is. And like I said, I mean, I think that the, you know, Bono and the, his red, his red iPods and all that stuff, um, and trying to make it sexy to want to change the world, um, I think that's something that architecture can do. I, I think that's a goal it can set for itself. I think it's a goal that it can accomplish. I think changing what happened to make the Katrina disaster possible is not something that architecture can do. Questions? Yeah. Um, hi, thank you. The, the sweep of stuff was like super interesting. Um, I was gonna, deciding whether or not to let the Bono, Bono thing go, and you just mentioned it, so I can't let it go now. <laughs> I do not understand how you can let Bono go off scot-free. If that's a provocation to us, that works. I mean, for me, he's entirely 2,000% more risible than, than, than Brad Pitt. I mean, pr precisely because Bono's the one who went to meet the, the Pope, no? I mean, yeah. and, he, and he shared the stage with Kofi Annan. I mean, the degree to which he's, um, his desire to be remembered, you know, not as a kind of um, uh, the most famous Irish pop band ever, but uh, a kind of prophet figure is extraordinary. But more to the point, the red thing, I just want two things, but the red thing, um, I don't know if you know about the Virgin Red credit card here, which is also part of the whole red um, charity. Oh, like to give your phenomenon. coins on the Virgin Yeah, those red which I things. find incredibly kind of like pernicious. No, I mean the, the the tagline is "Spend more and help the starving in Africa," and um, you know so the the subtext is get deeper and deeper in debt, but don't feel bad about it because you're saving some people's lives. In Africa, you know, and so I think there's, and Bono started that off, 
So I don't think he's scot free. Anyway, and the second point. Um, I knew somebody would give me. I that had to. You know. I despise him. Thank you. No, it's because he you. made really good records in the early 80s. No, Unf <laughs> unforgettable fire is a classic. Those early days. When he worked know? with Eno, you know, and then he lost it. No, uh, and that's what money does to you. So. But can I just ask you one thing, just as a point of information, because I was really, I tried hard to find out how much money the Red campaign has generated, and I, I could not find that figure, and so. I would just say, I would, I'm sure you're right, because how can anything be so ludicrous? You know, part of what attracts me to the Bono thing is that it is totally ludicrous. And, and I mean, I'm trying to be perverse and find these ludicrous things. But I think that on some bottom line issue, um, my general impression, and this may just be because Bono has a better PR machine than Angelina Jolie, is that Bono has generated more money for African causes than Angelina and Brad. Um, but I have no idea if that's true. I may just be a victim of this. Um, but I can tell you that new urbanism hasn't done anything good for New Orleans. So just if, if that's our, if that's our, my, my polls, you know, I set the bar low in that sense. Anyway, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but go, go no, ahead. No, absolutely. Oh, no, just one last little thing. I did just fly over on Virgin, surrounded by red stuff, watching The Last King of Scotland. So the whole Africa, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I'm with you. Go ahead. Um, no, and then, then it was something you said soon after that, which was uh, a kind of um, uh, berating and then a caution towards... Uh, what I would term sort of disciplinary trespassing, no? So moving away from the thing that you're supposed to know very well into something you might not know so well. And how does that fit, I mean, how does that fit with this, uh, one of the other kind of contemporary American theoretical obsessions at the mo moment, which is post-criticality, which, uh, which is a so-called return to architecture as, as architecture, as though all our excursions away from it are something that we kind of have to... Um, leave, as it were. So I'm just wondering where, where you fit. Because I, 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 for, not for one minute do I, I think your presentation is absolutely not of that ilk, but uh, at one level I'm wondering how does that, where do you fit in that relation? Uh, well, well, first of all, I think that we may have a, m a mutually different or one of us has a misunderstanding about what post-criticality in the U.S. means. I don't think it means a return to disciplinary tradition. Um, and I think, first of all, I think this is putting it at its best. Okay, there are bad post-criticalists and good post-criticalists too, so I'm just talking about the good ones. There's more than two. Uh, they have legions of graduate students all over the place, you know, and the graduate students, in fact, are the only ones that are using the terms anymore, so this, speaking about fashionability, it's way over, but you brought it up, so I'll give you my two cents about it. Um, I we just got it over here, we're always oh, late. You're you're <laughs> Movies always come out in the States first, we get it three, three months later. Uh, but you do it so much better, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I... I've, I've had this whole ongoing, you will have these stories to tell at some point in the near future, but I have this ongoing discussion with my seven-year-old daughter about serial movies. And I don't know, we were going to see, I, I don't know, Spider-Man 112 or whatever it was, and she said, oh, can't they come up with anything new? You know, she had learned this idea that doing it again meant somehow devaluating, devaluing the original. It's like, get with Benjamin, honey. And I said to her, you know, maybe the second one is better. You know, so, um, so that you do better. Uh, okay, uh, but I don't think that, so first of all, I think it's very important to, if you're gonna be sympathetic just to, for the purposes of exploration, post-criticality should never be understood as a return to anything. Um, post is in that sense a very bad, you know, we tend to misunderstand the word post as a returning, whereas it's really a surpassing, a going forward, a going beyond. So I, I think that it's be, and I, I'm not sure that I think that um, how much disciplinarity, a, a retrenching of disciplinarity has to do with post-criticality. I think that post-criticality really has more to do with the suspension of their, of the hermeneutics of suspicion. I mean, fundamentally, it's an ideological, um, it's an ideological change, which then brings with it theoretical, formal, technical, and so forth 
those kinds of changes. Um, one of the consequences of the emerging, or by now passe, I don't know, uh, resistance to the hermeneutics of suspicion is also a relinquishment of the idea that architecture, um, that building is always compromised. I don't know whether that's what you mean. In other words, in a critical model, anything that is, that is built, pretty much anything, in its materialization becomes complicit. Th this, is, this, in my opinion, is the lesson, the sad masochistic lesson that architects learned from people like Gordon Matta Clark, which is why if you take somebody like Peter Eisenman, um, every building he produced at that era is self-flagellating. I mean, in the most literal sense, it, it is apologetic about its buildinghood and every, qua every facet of its uh, materialization is already presented as coming apart, almost like a Gandhi, you know, view of the Bank of England or something. So, uh, but so I think that I think that it, the the um, the idea that the materialization and building practices and professionalism and so forth, uh, I, the idea that those do not have to a priori be complicit. Uh, that I would associate with p the post-criticality movement, but I would not think, I don't equate that with a, re with a retrenchment in disciplinarity. Is that, does that answer your question, or, or you mean where do I sit in relation no, to I'm that? I'm just wondering where you sit in relation to that. Uh, hmm. It was easier to talk about other people. Well, I was never super pro-paranoia in the first place. So, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I sort of been standing still and think that the rest of you caught up with me. Um, and I think a little bit that that's what Brett was saying. Uh, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm joking. Um, I, well, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, my, you know, my, you know, Jeff Kipnis and Bob Somel and I are, have been a kind of coffee clutch. And you know we are have many disagreements. No, Bo Bob and I have many disagreements. Jeff and I don't have many disagreements. Bob, this is more like a personality thing. Bob is just can be contrarian, but but I would say that over the course of the last ten years, the three of us have had a very productive and mutually provoking conversation. And from that point of view, compared to you know, probably a better question or another question would be, um, with whom do I share intellectual enemies? And I would say I share intellectual enemies with Bob and Jeff, probably for different reasons, and enemies is a very strong word. I, it doesn't need to be that strong. But um, is that an answer? <laughs> Sylvia, thank you very much for this evening. I, th I think that's a good ending for, um, for a conversation that will carry forward tomorrow morning. Thank you so much for the lecture. I, I, um, please join me in thanking you, Sylvia. Right thank you. I, I, I had Philip upstairs run a couple of dozen copies of Sylvia's.